everyone. Welcome to this week's SETI Institute seminar. Our speaker today is Lars Borg. He got his PhD at the University of Texas and then worked at NASA Johnson, right? And the University of New Mexico until about 10 years ago when he moved to the National Laboratory over in Livermore. He's worked on quite a wide range of topics, primarily trace element and isotope analysis, and in particular applied to studies of Mars and other terrestrial bodies in the solar system, and he'll be talking about some aspects of that today. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. I was um, originally asked to discuss a paper that I wrote, came out about six months ago, that was very heavily steeped in mathematics and isotope geochronology lore. And I thought it would be about the absolute worst thing to give to a, a, a general audience, although hopefully isotope geochemists are bouncing up and down in glee as they read it. So what instead I'm going to try to do is I'm going to try and give you uh, the bottom line on that paper, which has to do with how we can determine the differentiation age of silicate bodies like Mars and, and the Moon. And I'm not going to go into the mathematics. Rather, what I'm going to do is I'm going to focus on the historical development of this approach to understanding how planets form cores, mantles, and crusts. So the, the work is, is very heavily steeped in uh, an isotopic system that is my area of expertise, which is called the Samarium Neodymium system, which probably none of you have much familiarity with. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to begin by providing a, a brief background as to how the system can be used and what it consists of. And then I'll show you where we stood about 10 years ago with our understanding of differentiation of bodies like Mars based on this system. Unfortunately or fortunately, depending on which side of the, of the aisle you lie here, uh, there were some basic changes that were made to this isotopic system. So these ages are dependent on assumptions. Those assumptions are themselves based on measurements that are made in, the, uh, in meteorites and whatnot. And as our measurements got better, some of the assumptions changed. And a lot of the work that we originally did sort of became in question because uh, the assumptions were potentially less valid than we originally thought they were. So in order to investigate this, my group spent a fair bit of time going back and looking at some primitive meteorites, looking at the Samarium neodymium isotopic systematics of those, and using them to redefine the parameters of the Samarium neodymium system. And this led us to a lot of observations about how the, the protoplanetary disks formed, what the nature of input into the solar system was, so, and, and other related things that I'm going to briefly talk on here as, in the context of refining the Samarium neodymium system. And then once I establish that, I'm going to go back and revisit the original question of when did Mars form a crust and a mantle. So let me begin by uh, starting with the background of the system. So samarium neodymium, these are two elements uh, in the lanthanide group of the periodic table, and they're the basis for most of the chronology that we use to establish the age of differentiations of bodies. And the reason we use these is that there are two different isotopic systems that can be used. Samarium-147 decays to neodymium-143 with a half-life of about 106 billion years. That's extremely long in relation to the age of the solar system, which you all know is about 4.6 billion years. So this system is still alive. You can use this to date a granite in the Sierra, a meteorite from Mars, a highland rock from the moon. A more, a less used system, and, and a system that's, that's understood a, a little bit uh, more poorly, is samarium-146, which decays to neodymium-142. Now, this system has a half-life of about 103 million years. This system is extinct. It's analogous to systems that are extinct like aluminum-26, iron-60, so on, et cetera. The point here is that this system uh, is, can only be used to provide constraints on very old things. 
and in an isotope lore, you basically get about five to seven half-lives of a system before you can't tell if it's live anymore. So this system will get us to about 4.0 billion years or so, and then after that it provides very little chronologic information. The overall Sumerian Neodymium system is, is really powerful. First of all, because it does contain these two chronometers. Also, Sumerium and Neodymium have many different isotopes, which provide constraints on the environments under which they formed. Elements form in stars and supernova and by spallation reactions. Having a wide range of these various isotopes for these individual systems provides insight into where they actually formed. And finally, the uh, actually not finally, the third point here is that in order to apply chronology, you need to know the parent-daughter ratio of bulk planets, and this is fairly well understood through analysis of primitive meteorites. And finally, these elements are very difficult to fractionate from one another as a result of post-crystallization processes. So if I have a rock that's undergone some alteration on the surface of Mars, or I have a rock that's been involved in an impact process of some sort on the moon, I still have a very good chance of being able to obtain a reliable age from these. So the system is used to define the absolute age of samples. It's used to define the age of silicate differentiation on terrestrial planets, and it also can be used to evaluate contributions from supernova and stars uh, that contributed material to the protoplanetary disk before the, the sun formed and the planets condensed. Hence the Superman logo up here. Okay, so in order to apply these systems, several things must be known. Um, the, the assumptions for the two isotopic systems are listed here for the 147-143 system and here for the short-lived system. So in order to apply the, the 143 system, you must know the initial neodymium isotopic composition of the solar system. You need to know the bulk sumerium neodymium ratio. I'm, I'm an isotope geochemist, so elemental ratios are usually presented in the form of isotopic ratios, but you can just think of this as the amount of sumerium to the amount of neodymium present in the average body. And you need to know the Sumerium 147 half-life. This is the half-life. This is the parent that decays to neodymium-143. These are all fairly well established. The system is relatively robust. There's very little controversy here. In contrast, the parameters that we need to know to apply the Sumerium-146, neodymium-142 system are less well known. First of all, we must know the initial Sumerium-146 to Sumerium-144 ratio of the solar system. This is the isotope that is no longer, no longer exists in, the, in any materials other than nuclear reactors and such. And so we have to know what the, sis, the solar system was seeded with at the time it formed. We also have to know what the bulk neodymium-142, neodymium-144 ratio as, of the terrestrial planets as a whole and we need to know the half-life. And the problem here is that all of these are under debate at the moment, well, until recently. So, second thing I'd like to show you by way of background is how to actually obtain an age from these systems. So these are isochron plots. This is this, the long-lived system. I've plotted Sumerium-147, which is the parent isotope, divided by a neodymium isotope of 144 against the daughter isotope, neodymium-143, against the parent isotope, or a regular isotope of neodymium-144. So note essentially that the denominators of these two are the same. The, the uh, numerator on this axis is the parent, and this is the daughter. And the way you get an age from these is you take a rock that looks something like this background here. It contains a variety of minerals. You separate each one of these minerals. In this case, there's an olivine. This brown is pyroxene. This white is a plagioclase. You obtain very pure mineral separates, and you analyze them for sumerium-neodymium ratios and neodymium isotopic compositions. If the rock formed today, you would have a series of minerals with different sumerium-neodymium ratios because sumerium and neodymium are partitioned differently in each type of mineral. But they would all have the same neodymium isotopic composition because neodymium-143 is partitioned the same way as neodymium-144 into these mineral fractions. As a result, 
the minerals would lie on a straight line. So if I went and looked at a basalt from Hawaii that erupted last week, I would expect to see something that looked exactly like this. Now if I came back, say, 200 million years later and I looked at that same basalt, it wouldn't look like that. And the reason is, is that Samarium-147 would be decaying, producing Neodymium-143. These individual points would be moving along lines like this. And that 200 million year rock would have a line or have a distribution of data points that looks something like this. And it turns out that I can calculate the age of this particular rock from the slope of this line. On the right is an isochron for the short-lived system, and this is a little bit more complex because this system is extinct. On the lower axis here, I've plotted Samarium-144 against Neodymium-144. Remember, Samarium-146 is the parent, not 144, but it's extinct, no longer present. So this is simply an elemental ratio. This is Neodymium-144 against Neodymium, excuse me, Neodymium-142 against Neodymium-144. This is the isotope that's produced by the decay of samarium-146. In this case, I would measure a, a series of, of data points, and they too would define a slope. The slope would not be directly related to the age of the sample, however. Instead, the slope would be related to the initial samarium-146, samarium-144 that was inherited into the sample at the time it formed. What does that tell you? Absolutely nothing, unless you can compare this, this determined samarium-146-144 ratio against a samarium growth model. And that's what's presented down here. This is a plot of samarium-146, samarium-144 versus age. We assume that we know the initial samarium-146-144 ratio inherited into the solar system at the time it formed. Then using a very simple decay equation, I can calculate how that ratio would change through time so that by about uh, four, 4 billion years ago, the system is essentially extinct. Now I take the slope that I measure here, and I essentially extrap that value, extrapolate that value onto my growth curve and calculate an age. So this is an absolute age. It will tell you something. The only thing you need to know about it is the half-life. Here you need to know the initial samarium 146-144 ratio, as well as know the initial, uh, as well as knowing the half-life. So this, in fact, is a model age. <clears throat> the final bit of background I'd like to give you is that we can also tell where these rocks are from based on the y-intercepts on these plots. So the y-intercept indicates what the initial neodymium isotopic composition was of the rock at the time it formed. In this case, it would be a value here. Over here, it would be a value there. It turns out that this isotopic ratio is related directly to the samarium-neodymium ratio of the material from which these rocks are derived. And that samarium-neodymium ratio gives us a hint as to whether those rocks are derived from the crust or the mantle. And it works something like this. <clears throat> these are called TI diagrams and they're fairly confusing, so bear with me here. I think I can get us through this. This is a plot of the age of a sample versus something called epsilon neodymium value. You can basically think of this as simply the 143-144 ratio. This is the amount of parent, or excuse me, the amount of daughter isotope that's been produced. In this particular case, it's an epsilon value because we normalize it to what we predict is the growth for an average planet. So if we started 4.5 billion years ago with a, a planet, say the bulk Earth, we would expect it to grow along this red line here, having an epsilon neodymium value of zero. Samples that have samarium neodymium ratios higher than what we estimate for the bulk planet, which is about 0.19, will have uh, characteristics that are similar to rocks derived from the mantle. Translating that into isotopic decay, we would expect samples that formed from depleted reservoirs, like a mantle that formed 4.5 billion years ago, we would expect to see growth along a line like this, producing a value that we might measure today at something like an epsilon neodymium value of about plus 35. So samples, and these are actually Martian meteorites here, Samples that lie above this red line are indicative of materials that have been derived from, from the Martian mantle. On the other hand, 
samples that lie below the line are more typical, uh, have samarium neodymium ratios that are more typical of what we think of as crustal rocks. So by looking at this y-intercept, I can calculate an epsilon neodymium value and determine if the rock has geochemical affinities to the Martian or lunar or terrestrial mantle, or it has more affinities to the lunar mantle or terrestrial crust. And although I'm not going to go into it, you can do the same thing with the 142 system. Okay, so with this as our, our basis, we started to look into trying to determine the age of, of Martian planetary differentiation. So this is based on the analysis of Martian meteorites. There's been a variety of ages that have been determined from these, but basically they fall into four general categories. There's a young group here that range in age from about 165 to about 560 million years. They're known as shergatites. I'm going to try and call them basalts here because that's actually a more proper term and probably less confusing and less jargony. The second group of rocks are 1.3 billion years old or 1,310 million years old. Um, and these rocks are known as knocklites and chassignites. And then there are a couple of groups of rocks that are significantly older. Most of the work I'm going to be showing you today is based on the isotopic analyses of these rocks with a little bit of reference to these rocks. So the basaltic rocks and these knocklite and chassigny rocks. So the question is, is you know, what do these rocks actually look like? So this is, these are photomicrographs taken of various Martian meteorites. This is a Martian meteorite called Daralgani 476. It's a basaltic rock. It's characterized by having very large olivine phenocrysts represented here in a, a, a ground mass or in a, in a matrix of finer grain pyroxene, which are these, these brown jobs, and uh, plagioclase, which are the white jobs. This is very typical of what we might see in uh, a basaltic rock, say from the Cascades or something like that. Second group of rocks are also of the shergatite subclass, the basically basalts, and they look like they've crystallized significantly slower. There's a lot of pyroxene, and in the pyroxene are uh, a series of olivine minerals. The second group of, of rocks are typically 1.3 billion years old. These are knocklites. These are minerals of clinopyroxene. These look like rocks that are derived from the mantle, although current interpretations suggest these things arrive on Mars in the bottom of very deep lava flows. And then there are rocks uh, called chassignites, which are basically dunites, which are very typical of, of mantle rocks. Both of these two rocks cooled relatively slowly. This cooled less slowly, and this cooled relatively quickly. So these rocks have a range of geochemistries and isotope compositions. So this is an isotope-isotope plot. This is sort of the standard plot you make when you're looking at the petrogenesis of basalts from the terrestrial environment. And what I've plotted here is a strontium-8786 ratio versus the epsilon-neodymium-143 value. So this is the isotopic composition determined of the element strontium. And the reason it varies is that strontium-87 is the daughter product of rubidium-87. Rubidium-87 decays to strontium-87. If that happens a long time ago, the 87-86 ratio of that particular material is relatively high. It turns out that rubidium is concentrated into crustal rocks, and as a result, samples that have very high 87-86 ratios, like these groups over here, have characteristics of crustal rocks. And you can see that's consistent with the neodymium isotopic compositions. Here's the zero line, which would be indicative of something that didn't have any differentiation at all. These values uh, for epsilon neodymium are around minus 10, consistent with derivation from crust. These rocks over here are consistent with derivation from uh, mantle-like environments. And the point to note here is that there's an amazing amount of variation here in this suite of rocks. If I was to compare the terrestrial array of basalts, it would fill a field about this big on this, on this diagram. So there's a tremendous range of isotopic compositions giving hint to the fact that the source regions of these materials, the crust and the mantle, formed a long time ago, allowing lots of isotopic growth to occur.
Okay, so the, the first real foray into this field to understand when Mars uh, went under, uh, excuse me, experienced differentiation was by uh, a person by the name of Shiyu Shi in 1982. And I consider this to be one of the most insightful, great papers that nobody ever cites anymore. But this paper really was an eye-opener for me when I first read it, and it was because they made this plot. This is a rubidium strontium isochron plot. So this is rubidium, the parent isotope, against strontium, the daughter isotope. And what they did was they took a bunch of Martian basalts and they measured the rubidium strontium isotopic systematics and they plotted them on this diagram. And what they noted was that if you drew regressed a line through this data, it had a slope that corresponded to about 4.5 billion years. And the really insightful thing that they realized was that this probably reflects the time of differentiation of Mars. And their logic was like this. If the Martian mantle and crust formed at about 4.5 billion years ago, initially the crustal rocks would have very high rubidium strontium ratios. The mantle rocks would have essentially zero uh, amount of rubidium remain because it's strongly partitioned into the crust. So the, the source regions of these rocks would lie along a line like this, very analogous to the isochron that I showed you earlier. But with radiogenic growth, these rocks would evolve along trajectories like this. And in this scenario, the meaning of this age would reflect the time of differentiation of the body. So I was fortunate enough for my postdoc to work with this group starting in about 1996. And when I first got there, they said, you know, you need to work on some Martian meteorites. And I said something like, yeah, that'll be when pigs fly or something like that, because I had absolutely no interest in working on Martian meteorites. I wanted to work on lunar basalts. And so they said, well, we'll let you work on some basalts if you just do these meteorites for us. And I said, okay, okay. So I got, kicking, I got drug kicking and screaming into this, uh, into this field. And the first rock that I worked on was this rock called QUE 94201. And it was a fairly interesting rock because we noticed that it had very high neodymium-142 isotopic compositions. So this is a TI diagram like I showed you previously. If we start off with a body that has a terrestrial or, or basic bulk planet-like composition, it would grow along a line that looks something like this. So if we looked at rocks from the Earth, they would all have values that lied around zero. However, this particular rock has a value that was extremely high. Not only that, we could make an estimate of what the samarium neodymium ratio was in the source and calculate when the source region that this basalt we had in our hand was derived from. So we basically took the value we had, we back calculated it using a very simple decay equation and determined when it intersected this model growth for an undifferentiated body. And we calculated an age of 4.53 billion years. And this agreed perfectly with the RBSR age and we thought, aha, there you have it. Mars differentiated a, a crust and a mantle at 4.53 billion years. So at this point I was thinking about this uh, a fair bit, and I started applying the, the geochemistry that I had learned from basalts and the Cascades to the Martian rocks. And what I did was I calculated the elemental ratios of the mantle source regions from which these basalts were derived from. So I've plotted these all up here for the rocks that existed at the time. This is from a paper I wrote in about 2003. So this is the samarium neodymium ratio calculated from the mantle source region from which the basalts are derived. This is the rubidium strontium ratio calculated the same way. This is another isotopic pair, lutetium hafnium. And what we noticed was that the data points for these individual rocks fall along these beautiful curved arrays. And from a geochemist standpoint, when you see ratio ratio plots formed curved arrays, that's a smoking gun that you have some sort of mixing process occurring. And what I did was I modeled the compositions of source regions from the moon, where the petrology was very well known, and I calculated that the lunar mantle should have compositions that lied somewhere down here, uh, 
a material on the moon called creep, which is very enriched in incompatible elements and maybe in some senses analogous to the crust, would lie down here. And when I took these two compositions and I mixed them together, I found that they reproduced all the isotopic variation that I would see in all these suites. And this was very significant because what it meant was that these rocks are likely to be mixtures of materials that likely formed at the beginning of the planet when it initially differentiated. So if it formed a mantle with a composition here 4.5 billion years ago, it forms a crust or something that looks like lunar creep rich material down here, and those two things mixed together, I can explain all the isotopic systematics. And this was very powerful because when I plotted this in neodymium neodymium space, it allowed me to determine a very precise age for the differentiation of Mars. And that's presented on this plot. This is a plot of epsilon neodymium 142 value versus epsilon neodymium 143 value. It turns out that in this particular scenario, the crustal-like material would lie down here, the mantle-like material would lie down here, the slope of this line is proportional to the age at which those two materials formed. So if they formed at 4.56 billion years ago, they would lie along a line that looks something like this. If they formed at 4.2 billion years ago, they'd lie along a line that looks something like that. And in fact, when I regressed a line through this and solved these equations iteratively, I calculated an age of about 4.52, plus or minus about 20 million years. This agreed both with the RBSR isochron that I had determined, or that she had determined, and it also agreed with the single model age that I had determined on, the, uh, on QUE. This was sort of the, what I thought was the smoking gun that Mars underwent a differentiation event at this time. Now then, this is about the time the wheels started falling off the cart, and this was because a series of assumptions that go into constructing these types of models were brought into question. So let me show you what those, uh, what those assumptions were and, and how they were questioned. The first thing that happened, well, actually the last thing that happened, but the first thing I'm going to talk about, was that somebody redetermined the Samarium 146 half-life. The value that we had been using for years and years was 103 million years. This had been determined by two or three different studies. Uh, but these guys did a very detailed study and determined something that was closer to 70 million years, causing an adjustment in age. Difficult but not impossible to deal with. The other thing that came out of this study was that the Samarium 146-144 value that we had always assumed was 0.0085 was recalculated to be 0 0.0094. And that's illustrated on this diagram here. The data points are individual meteorites. And what they did was they recalculated, a, regressed a line through this, and calculated what the Samarium 146 value was at t equals zero. And then finally, and perhaps the most hard to deal with, was what with the advancement of technology, we began to be able to measure neodymium-142 with significantly more precision than we could previously. And what we found was that the terrestrial value represented by this field here was significantly different than the chondritic value that were measured in a group of different types of meteorites. And this is really important because the neodymium-142 value that we assumed up to this point was the terrestrial value. It's very easy to measure terrestrial standards, so on, et cetera. However, the chondritic values were significantly different, and this implied that perhaps our interpretations of our chronology were, were incorrect. And it also led to some very wild ideas about the formation of the Earth. In particular, the fact that 142 was different than, than uh, chondritic meteorites led to the suggestion that there may be a, a hidden mantle reservoir of neodymium that we hadn't seen in any crustal rocks. Another idea that was, was floated was that perhaps the Earth inherited an anomalously high samarium neodymium ratio. In other words, the basic premise of geochemistry that chondrites represent bulk planets was incorrect. And finally, there was an idea that perhaps crustal neodymium that was isotopically distinct was lost during the giant impact as a result of shedding a greater proportion of crustal rocks from the Earth 
than mantle rocks during this event. But what it meant for the samarium, neodymium, isotopic systematics of Martian rocks was basically this. If we recalculated the age for the, the chronometer here, we ended up with an age that was about 30 million years, 25 million years older than what we calculated before, which is not a killer, but it does make things a little more difficult because that means that crusts on large bodies have to form within a few tens of millions of years of the beginning of the solar system, requiring very rapid accretion and processing. But perhaps the most difficult thing to explain was the fact that the bulk planet should have a composition that lies right here. And it, this, incidentally, is the isotopic composition of the Earth. However, chondrites now lie down here. And so the fact that these rocks, this array, did not go through what we estimated was the bulk planet meant that this whole construction may be fallacious. So in order to address this, we started looking at a variety of, of primitive materials. The first uh, that we looked at were uh, a group of materials called calcium aluminum rich inclusions. These are some of the first solids to form in the solar system. They have very high condensation temperatures. They're composed of a lot of refractory elements that don't convert out, that convert from gas to solid at very high temperatures. So these are uh, enriched in calcium, uh, aluminum, and fortunately for us, rare earth elements. This is coincidence that I worked on this because at this time I came to Lawrence Livermore National Lab and started working with one of the world's experts on CAIs. And he happened to have a drawer full of these things that had mineral separates already prepared. And so what we did was we determined samarium neodymium isochrons on these mineral separates on this exact CAI here. And these are the results that we presented. This is, again, the samarium neodymium ratio. This is the neodymium-143 value. So this is the long-lived system. Here's all the data that we analyzed. And we obtained an age of 4.56 billion years. Of course, that dates the age of CAIs, which is very well known. This is how we date the age of the solar system. But the fact that we were able to reproduce this age meant that any post-crystallization processes that could have disturbed the samarium neodymium system probably were not active in this particular sample. So that allowed us to go and make the same analogous measurement using the short-lived system. So this is a plot of samarium-144, neodymium-144, against neodymium-142, 144. Again, here are all our mineral fractions. And the interesting thing about this is that the slope of this line defines the initial samarium isotopic composition of the solar system. And it turns out that we got a value of 0 0.0083, which was essentially the value that we had been using initially. We also went back and recalculated the age of this system, and we found that if we use the 68 million year half-life, we got an age that was significantly too old. So this study basically allowed us to determine that the 103 million year half-life that we'd always used and the initial samarium 146-144 ratio that we'd always used was perhaps correct. Having made these these isochron measurements, at this point, we started exploring ways to determine ages using both isotopic systems. So the, the gist of the paper that I was supposed to be talking about was the mathematical derivation of how to determine an age on this type of plot. This is a plot of neodymium-143-144, the long-lived uh, daughter product, against 142-144, the short-lived daughter product. The calcium aluminum rich inclusion that I just showed you lies, is defined by these red data points. A line regressed through this using the mathematics we developed, yields an age of 4.56 billion years. And at that point, what I did was I said, well, we have this funny thing going on with these primitive meteorites. They're different than the Earth. What we probably do is look and see if we have a covariation of these two isotopic systems because all the work that had been proposed up to this point had suggested that samarium and neodymium had been fractionated one way or another in the history of the Earth, and that we would expect to see a variety of lines that shift like this when we plotted 
the primitive meteorites on this type of diagram. So this is the plot I made. I made this plot actually on the mass spec computer while we we're pulling data off of it. And you can see that the chondritic material, which is basically everything but these red and orange dots, lies in a vertical array here. What that means is that the neodymium 143-144 value, the long-lived system, is essentially invariant. And all the variation we're seeing here is in 142-144. This means that you can't have a hidden reservoir on the Earth to explain the difference between chondritic meteorites and terrestrial neodymium-142. You can't have an anomalously high samarium neodymium ratio for the bulk Earth. And you can't have lost crustal neodymium during the giant impact because all of these processes involve fractionating samarium and neodymium. And both of these two systems would respond similarly. So about the same time, I had a postdoc come work with me named Greg Branica, and he had discovered that there were isotopic variations in uranium in CAIs. And he postulated that this reflected the presence of curium-247 um, that was produced in a supernova. <clears throat> and what he asked me was, is there some way we can test this using some other isotopic systems? So the basic idea here is that there are two main processes that produce isotopes uh, in stellar environments. The first are uh, two neutron capture processes. The first is something called the slow process. This is thought to occur in large stars like AGB stars. What happens if you look at a plot of the a chart of the nuclides, this is the number of neutrons, this is the number of protons. Very hard to see, but these little dark squares here are the stable elements and isotopes that are produced. During the slow process, capture of neutrons occurs at about the same pace that you get isotopic decay. So what that means is that you produce a series of elements that basically go right down the middle of this uh, val so-called valley of stability. So what that means is if you have an isotope that ranges from 150 to 160, most of the elements that are going to be produced are going to be right in the middle at sort of mass 155. The R process is a process that's thought to occur mostly in supernova. This is an extremely neutron-rich environment. You have lots of neutron capture occurring. The neutron capture is significantly faster than the, the decay rate. As a result, you tend to produce elements that are very rich in neutrons. So in this case, these would be elements that would hover around the 160 range. So what we decided to do was look at various elements that we had expertise measuring and see if we could see systematic differences in the proportions of isotopes that were produced by R process and S process. So this diagram is presented here. This is a, from a paper in uh, the Proceedings of the National Academy of Science that came out in 2013 that Greg wrote. And what he found was that if you look at the right-hand side of these diagrams here, these are the elements that are produced almost exclusively in, in supernovas. What you can see is for elements in the low mass range, in this case molybdenum, which has a mass range near 100, you have excesses in R process isotopes. This is an excess in, a, in another process called P process, so, so please ignore it in the context of, of, of this discussion. If you look at something like barium, you see only slight enrichments in R process. You look at something like neodymium, you see strong depletions in R process. And when you look at something like samarium, you even see stronger depletions in R process. And if you plot the values, which is the, basically the magnitude of the anomaly against the isotopic composition, what you see is that elements lighter than mass 140 have R process excesses and masses lower than 140, or greater than 140, excuse me, have R process uh, deficits. And this implied, and this, all these measurements were made, I should say, in, in calcium aluminum rich inclusions, which are the first solids to form in the solar system. So what this means is that the isotopic compositions of the first solids that formed are different than what we see on the Earth. The terrestrial value is basically represented by a flat line here. The CAIs are represented by these enrichments and depletions in our process isotopes, and there appears to be 
a mass dependence associated with this. So what Greg postulated was that there were multiple contributions from supernova contributing materials to the nebula at the time that the calcium aluminum rich inclusions formed. And in cartoon view, his view was this. You had a region where the CAIs formed that had this typical pattern of, of R process enrichments and deficits like I just showed you. There was a second supernova that contributed material into the nebula that had essentially the converse uh, pattern. And then when these two materials mixed together and formed the planets, we ended up with these relatively flat lines. <clears throat> and the reason I've, I go through here was that as we were thinking about this, we realized that this might offer an explanation for the 142 isotopic variation that we were seeing in the differences between the Earth and the chondritic meteorites. <clears throat> and so we teamed up with a group from Germany and the University of Chicago, and what we started to do was to measure neodymium isotopic compositions with very high levels of precision in primitive meteorites. And the idea was not to confirm that there's differences in 142 values, but rather to see if the differences we see in 142 are also seen in other isotopes that reflect nucleosynthetic processes. So this work was presented by Christoph Burkhardt. It was accepted to Nature last week. So this is sort of the first, first presentation of this uh, post-publication. So this is a plot of the various neodymium isotopes that, are, um, that we measured in these primitive meteorites. This is 142, 145, 148, and 150. These are both basically dominated by R process. The literature values are represented down here. The values that we determine in our study are represented here. So we spent a fair bit of time trying to develop this system to get this as precise as possible so that we can measure things as accurately as possible so that we could see these very small levels of differences. So to give you a sense here, these values here are, although they're written in, in um, um, mu units, this is essentially 10 ppm, 20 ppm, or 30 ppm variation. So these are extremely difficult measurements to make. These, these samples were oftentimes run for a couple of days solid on a mass spectrometer. So if you look at the values, you can see that we confirm the, the deviations of the 142, but you can also see that in a few cases here, you can see isotopic anomalies in other R process isotopic systems. And in fact, when you plot neodymium-142 against these other isotopic systems, you see correlations. And what this means is that chondritic meteorites have a nucleosynthetic component that's not present in the Earth. They're fundamentally distinct. So what that means is that the materials that were sampled were likely too small to be representative of bulk planets at the 10 to 20 ppm level. And that allows us to go back and evaluate the neodymium-142 of Mars in the context of what we measure on the Earth. The Earth is a large reservoir. It's probably done a better job of averaging what the true neodymium isotopic composition of the solar system was at the time that formed. The con chondritic meteorites that have been previously used are probably just not representative, again, at this 10 to 20 ppm level. So in summary, the neodymium isotopic compositions of the solar system materials are variable. The half-life um, prob of Sumerium-146 is 103 million years. The solar system initial 146-144 value is close to the traditional value, not this, this newer value. Neodymium-142 of bulk planets is similar to Earth, probably not to chondritic meteorites. And so with this information in hand, we can now go back and look and apply this system to Mars. And this is what we've done with this paper that I was asked to talk about. So this is the neodymium-142 plot, isochron plot. These are the values we've measured. I hope you can notice from the previous plots the error bars are significantly smaller because we've gotten significantly better at this. However, when we regress a line through this and we use the model parameters that we've determined from the chondritic meteorites, 
we get an age of about uh, 4.5 billion years, and we have an uncertainty that's hovering around 6 million years. Using the other, isochrop, other isochron technique, this is a plot of epsilon 142 against epsilon 140, excuse me, epsilon neodymium 143 against epsilon neodymium 142. This is the analogous plot that I first started out with way back when. Again, you can see the data lie on a line. The slope of this line, in this case, is 4.504 uh, billion years. It has a very small uncertainty of probably closer to 5 million years. You can see that the Earth lies within air of the apex here, which is what we would expect if the Earth is representative of the bulk planet. And so this gives us a pretty good understanding and, and, and feeling that what we're really looking at here is the age of differentiation of Mars, and it's occurring fairly late in solar system history. <clears throat> so the second to last slide I'd, I'd like to show you is that we've also gone back and we've looked at this from the moon. This is an analogous plot, Samarium 147, 144, Nidim 142, 144. This is a series of lunar basalts, lunar rocks from the crust, uh, everything that has been analyzed in my lab uh, for this. And when we regress a line through all this data, we have an age of 4.33 plus or minus about 15 or 20 million years. And so with this in mind, it paints a picture of the solar system in which we have differentiation on Mars occurring relatively late, about 60 million years after the formation of the solar system. Differentiation on Moon appears to be occurring significantly later than that. It may offer some insights into the timing of the giant impact that formed the Earth from, or formed the Earth, excuse me, formed the Moon from the Earth. Um, <clears throat> so, in conclusion, the Samarium neodymium ages, model ages based on known assumptions. Uh, we've determined the 146 half-life to be 103 million years. This allows the system to be used. The terrestrial 142-144 ratio is representative of bulk planets. A lot of the, the models that have been speculated to account for differences with chondritic meteorites are probably not necessary. Rather, this seems to reflect nucleosynthesis. The initial 146-144 is now fairly well established. Uh, the isochron that I showed you for the CAI is by far the best 142 isochron that's ever been produced, and it establishes the 146-144 value with a very small uncertainty. The solar system materials uh, appear to be derived from at least two supernova sources. The CAIs have one isotopic composition that are enriched in, the lighter elements are enriched in our process, whereas the heavier elements, elements heavier than 140, seem to be depleted, where there is a, essentially a, uh, what's the right word, uh, a supernova component with the opposite geochemical signature being added in uh, later after the CAI is formed. The age of silicate differentiation on Mars is about 4.5 billion years. The best constraint on the age of differentiation of the Moon is significantly younger, and this probably reflects uh, processes associated with the giant impact. Thank you. We have plenty of time for questions, so if you Indicate to me that you have questions, I'll run around with the microphone. All right, we'll start in the front here. Thank you. That was a great detective story you told there. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, uh, one loose end in the detective story I'm curious about. I know it's not your study, but you said that there had been a study of samarium isotopes that uh, yielded a half-life of 0.68. And that was, uh, you said, more precise than the earlier ones. And obviously, you agree with the earlier ones and not that, but it's still a whopping big difference. Do you have a theory as to why their study was so far off? Yeah, it's a, it's a, complicated, uh, it's a complicated measurement to make. I mean, it was done with uh, accelerator mass spectrometry and, and artificially en enriched isotopic signatures. And I'm not an expert in those type of measurements but I suspect it's, it's an analytical effect. But I don't know what that is. Um, 
it's v all these chronometers are really heavily steeped in knowing the, the half-lives precisely. And to really be, to be independent, what we would like to be able to do is get the same age from materials using chronometers with half-lives that are determined separately. The truth and the test of this is whether the ages agree. And the problem here is that they don't. When we look at lunar rocks, where we do both 142 and 144 isotopic measurements, and we calculate ages, the, the difference is quite dramatic. And so it seems unlikely that one system would be undisturbed and the other system disturbed, given the fact that we're looking at materials that are basically derived from the same parent element, samarium, and the same daughter element, neodymium. But without being an expert in these, in these uh, analytical techniques associated with the accelerator mass spec, I can only suspect what the problem might be. Were there other questions? So if there were at least two different supernovas, what was the difference between the two of them? Were, were they... Uh, likely formed at roughly the same age, but, but had different masses that produced uh, different isotope ratios? Or were they two different ages from two different starting materials? Yeah, again, you're, 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 you're hitting me in an area where, you know, I'm, I'm not a, an astrophysicist, and the literature I find to be rather daunting. But um, what I have read is that there are types of supernovas that have been speculated which have different productions of light and heavy masses. They're called L-type and H-type supernovas, and this is from a paper that came out by, unfortunately, a bunch of geochemists, not astrophysicists. <laughs> but the, the interesting thing is, is that this particular paper predicts that the difference between the L-type supernova and the H-type supernova is <clears throat> that you will see enrichments at mass above 140 and depletions below that for one type, and you'll see the inverse for the other type. So they sort of magically came up with this uh, 140 tipping point that, that we see in the CAI. So it seems like it's reasonable, but as far as I know, this, this model has only been referenced in, in one paper. Now, why it exists, I, I'm sure it must have to do with the size of the supernova and, and the type of supernova that was involved in that, the neutron densities and the, and the, uh, and the type of starting material that you have. Any more questions here? All right, just pass the mic that way. I might have missed something. What, what does CAI stand for? I'm sorry. It's calcium aluminum rich inclusion. And the significance of calcium aluminum rich inclusions is that they're composed of materials that um, condense at very high temperatures. And the reason that that's significant is that in the model that we have for the solar system, we go from a state of high temperature to low temperature. CAIs have one of the highest condensation temperatures of any of the materials we have, and so from a purely physics perspective, they're likely to represent the oldest material in the solar system. And a fair bit of t energy has been spent looking at the lead-lead uh, isotopic systematics of these materials, and they do in fact appear to have the oldest age. So when we speak of the age of the solar system as it's measured directly, that's largely based on chronologic investigations of CAIs, which yield an age of about 4.567, plus or minus a, a fractions of some million years. Oh, I had an observation, I guess, from the um, Scientific American, a recent one had an article on supernovas. And the, Looks like there's about six different types. So mm -hmm. this looks like another area you could do is uh, if the astrophysicists, you know, can narrow down those what is produced in each of those six types. Maybe we can 
there's some correlation between your work and their work. Yeah, I agree. This is this is a gap in in what we have done, and uh, I've also read the article, uh, and and you know from from my perspective, it was it was a bit enlightening, I must admit, um, but the. Um, Many types of supernovas are just inappropriate because they don't generate masses, you know, this high up. So you're forced to look at various types of type two supernovas and whatnot. But yeah, that that's really where we we need to to go at this point. What we're trying to do, or actually what Greg Brenica is trying to do, is he's trying to extend that curve out so he looks at significantly more elements. So we have. Uh, uh, a more unique footprint that can be used to apply to these models. So he's expanded it both up mass and down mass. So I showed you as the state of our art in you know 2013, but he's he's working on that to to expand that with the goal of assigning uh, more constraints on the types of supernovas. Yeah. And and I should also add that the the CAIs when they form. <coughs> may have some of that second supernova in them. It just isn't completely mixed in at the same proportions that we see in the Earth. So if you have a, a background of material that reflects supernovas, you know, continually contributing to the molecular cloud, and then you have another supernova, it adds something to the CAIs, but it, it hasn't mixed with that molecular cloud to the perfect extent so that you end up with the exact same isotopic compositions that you see of Earth. You may have answered the question, but I guess uh, it takes a core collapse uh, supernova to actually make heavier elements like that, not a type one. Right. That's that's right. <clears throat> Hi. You've mentioned the moon, the Earth, and Mars, and built a self-consistent story with them all. There's one other object in the solar system we have information about. This is the asteroid Vesta. Mm -hmm. Where does that fit in to the story? Yeah, I don't, I don't know. I have not actually worked on HED meteorites, and it's something that I need to branch out into. Um, my suspicion is that we're going to see a very different uh, type, of, type of story there. The work that has been done demonstrates that these rocks are extremely old. They appear to be derived from sources that have differentiated so that there are, there's evidence that uh, they have cores, they've had uh, silicate fractionation occur on them. So if I was to speculate what we would see in the neodymium context is I would expect to see something like Mars except significantly earlier. We see uh, a fractionation event, it's probably occurring within a couple of ten, you know, tens of millions of years of the beginning of the solar system, maybe five or ten, something like that. And ultimately, this gets to be uh, of, of significance because when you start trying to accrete planets together, you realize that there's going to be things like Vesta hitting these planets and accreting, and they're also likely to have undergone a differentiation event. And so that differentiation has to be recorded in the isotopic systematics of the bulk planet. So in the models I've presented here, I've sort of thrown that under the bus and, and ignored it. But ultimately, some of the subtle differences that we see in isotopic systematics, not so much of samarium neodymium, but say of tungsten hafnium on, on Mars, these type of questions may be very, relative, re, very relevant. Okay, one last question. I'm always struck by how uh, close in age a lot of these oldest things are, you know, 4.5 to 4.6 billion years. And I'm wondering, uh, are there any geochemists looking for evidence of uh, much older stuff that might have come from other solar systems and wandered this way? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the, yes, they are. And th that material has been found. It's called presolar grains. These are typically silicon carbide grains. Uh, they have isotopic anomalies in them that are extreme, and they clearly don't look like anything from the, the solar system. 
And the idea with these materials is that they basically survive the heating event associated with the, the ignition of the sun and the, the heating of the molecular cloud. These materials are, uh, there probably were a variety of these materials, most of which have been essentially melted away and brought into the bulk of, of the solar system itself. But these silicon carbide grains are refractory enough that they survive. <clears throat> Unfortunately, they're extremely small, you know, few microns in size. And there's been investigations where people take meteorites, they break them apart, and they look for these refractory grains. But by the time they get them, they're, very, they're too small to do any chronology on. Any chronology that we could do based on beam analysis type things is, requires a series of assumptions to be made about the starting isotopic compositions, which aren't appropriate for these particular materials. So there's no real way that we can date them, but we do know that they must have predated the formation of the solar system. Okay. Lars will be staying around after if you all have more questions, and we'll thank him again. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, awesome. Thank you.